Our Bible word is Romans 15 verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is Apostle Paul. He's writing to the congregation in Rome. And to understand the last few chapters of Romans, we must look at the historical context of Jews and Christians in Rome and what happened in the late 40s, etc. And as Christianity spread out, it also eventually reached Rome. Probably people that were on pilgrimage in Jerusalem, they took the message back to Rome. And it caused conflict between Jews who accepted the message of the gospel and those who did not. If we go read the historical records there, of also of Roman historians, it's in the year 49 AD, there was an edict by the Emperor Claudius, and this edict reads, Since the Judeans or the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, because of this the Jewish population were expelled from Rome, and this is in the year 49 AD. So Jews and Christians, sorry, Jew, Jews who did not believe in Jesus and those who accepted the message, it seems like they were argued, they caused conflict, and then the Emperor Claudius expelled them from Rome in the year 49 AD. So we can see already in the late 40s, or by the 40s, there was large numbers of believers in Jesus among Rome or in Rome already and it caused conflict in the Jewish community. So with the Jews being expelled, this is the reason why Paul also couldn't go to Rome earlier. If we go to Romans 1 verse 13, Paul writes there, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but I was hindered until now. And this was also largely due to Paul's previous missionary journeys, but also now, because of this expulsion of the Jews from Rome. But Emperor Claudius, he died in the year 54. And so that edict also went away, or it fell away. So many of the Jews started returning to Rome, including those Jews that started or believed in Jesus. But this would have been also very difficult for these Jewish Christians in Rome, because they were the reason that the Jews were expelled and Christianity was already starting to break away from its Jewish roots, so that they now identify as a separate group eventually. So, but also now, because the Gentile believers remained behind in Rome, when the Jewish Christians started coming back, they now formed the minority. They were not the ones in control, so to speak. They were not the ones in charge or the dominant factor in the early congregations. And there was friction. Jewish Christians against Gentile Christians. And especially around issues of Jewish laws. Because there were Jews who were still felt compelled to know they must observe the Sabbath. They must still observe the food laws. And the festival days. A critical thing here is especially meat, because most meat was sacrificed to idols before it was made available for, for sale and usage in the marketplace. And so Jews who felt, still felt scruples about this, they felt, I can't eat with Gentiles who eat this meat. And also there were some who observed the Sabbath, others who said, no, that's not really critical anymore. So there was friction in terms of fellowship between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And part and parcel of those last chapters in Romans is for Paul to write to them and say, no, come together and accommodate one another. Especially from chapters 14 to 15, it's about mutual accommodation around food laws and holy days. Because remember that Jews traditionally, they had strict boundaries. They understood themselves as the divine or divinely elected people, the people of God. And traditionally, their boundary markers were things like the food laws 
There were certain foods you can eat or not eat. It was also observing the Sabbath and circumcision. And if you observe those things, you belong to Israel. You're a Jew. You're a faithful Jew. But for Paul and his Christianity that he brought, it's changed. The boundary markers have changed now. The people of God has changed because now it consists of Jew and Gentile. And Paul also refers to them as the Israel of God. And here the boundary markers is Christ, of course. It's faith. It's love. In other words, works performed through love. And also the Holy Spirit that characterizes the new people of God. So now as how do you renegotiate the boundaries? What's essential? What must all people of God adhere to now? And there were disagreement about it. So if we go to chapter 14, at right at the beginning, Paul wants to bring this group together. And he says there, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. So for Paul, these doubtful things are the food laws. It's also even including Sabbath observance, of course, circumcision, etc. It's those normal things that would separate or create social boundaries between Christian Jews and Gentiles. Paul refers to them as doubtful things. And he refers to those who still feel that they must observe it. He refers to them as the weak. The strong are those who don't worry about eating meat sacrificed to idols or this or that, about these traditional social boundary issues. Now Paul says to the strong, accommodate the weak. Those who still feel very strongly about these things. If we read verse 2, For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. So we can see here, yeah, some believed they can eat anything, including meat sacrificed to idols. Others said, no, I can't eat that. It's tainted. It's impure because it was sacrificed to an idol. And those who thought that way, Paul refers to as the weak. So he's encouraging now who he calls the strong. In other words, those who are, are not worried about these scruples anymore. Accommodate the weak. If we also read in Verse 3, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. So Paul's main point of argument here is don't let doubtful things destroy the fellowship within the Christian community. It's not essential. If you eat or not eat, if you eat meat sacrifice to idols or not, it's a doubtful thing. It's not essential. Paul encourages them, focus on what's important. Christ, the salvation that's available in Christ, the role of the Holy Spirit, etc. Focus on those things that are important. Now, of course, Paul encourages the strong, accommodate the weak. Don't reject them. In a similar way, he tells those who are still worried about those scruples, Accept them who do eat meat sacrificed to idols. Do not reject them. Because God has welcomed them. They are now part of the community. We go to verse 19. Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace. And the things by which one may edify one another. So Paul says don't argue about doubtful things. It's not essential for our faith. It's not essential to be a Christian. If you want to do it, okay. If you don't want to do it, that's also okay. Each one must be convinced in his own mind, Paul says. But don't use it as an excuse. Don't demand on your rights. I want to do the right thing and not eat that meat. Or other says, man, let's, we eat this meat and you must just accept that. So Paul says, don't do that. Accommodate one another. Receive one another like Christ has received you. Don't insist on your personal rights or what you believe to be true. The thing is, accommodate each other so you don't harm or damage their faith. Especially in chapter 13 and 14, Paul encourages the strong, don't look down on those who are weak. Accommodate one another. 
if they don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat when you're in their presence. When you're at home, okay, eat meat sacrifice to idols, but not when you're in fellowship or together. Give up that right. Meet, meet them, accommodate them. And then Paul also speaks about Christ as our example. That's the beginning of chapter 15. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Now comes the cracks also. For even Christ did not please himself. So that's Christ is the example of our ethics, Christian ethics. Christ did not please himself. In a similar way, we must, mustn't demand our standards or expectations, especially about doubtful things, things that are not essential for salvation. To insist on them, let's accommodate one another. And now Paul comes to our immediate Bible word. That's from Romans 15, verse 7 to 13. He now concludes this, how they must come together. And what's the basis for this? And this concluding summary is about God's mercy and faithfulness. That's to the Jew first, but also to the Gentiles. And similar to chapter 14, verse 1, he again encourages them. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So what's the basis for this? Remember, for Paul, things have radically changed now. There's a new humanity on the scene. There's a new community of faith on the scene. And it was God being faithful to what he promised to Abram, to the prophets. Firstly, God promised to his own people, the Jewish people, he will send the Messiah, he will send the Redeemer. And that is God being faithful to Abram and to the patriarchs and to the Jewish people. God is faithful to them. Often in Romans, Paul says, to the Jew first. And then to the Gentile, God has remained faithful. So he's also telling the Gentile believers, don't overestimate yourselves. Also in chapter 11, Paul speaks, you remember you were the wild olive branches and you were grafted into this established olive tree. Israel, God's people, the Jewish people, because they have primacy. It's through them that salvation has come. Don't become arrogant. Remember that you were grafted in. God remained faithful to, the, to his promises to his Jewish people. They have primacy. They're the first ones that were there. And now he also writes to the Jewish believers. But God always had the Gentiles also in mind. Don't forget that. And now he quotes several passages from the Psalms, from Deuteronomy, also from Isaiah, it's about the Gentiles praising God or, or, or where the Jewish people set an example for others in Gentile lands so the Gentiles can praise God. Especially that quote from Isaiah, he says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. So Paul is driving the point home. Jewish believers, God was faithful to you, but also remember this. God also always had the Gentiles in view. Yeah, this God in whom people will hope. It says that in him the Gentiles shall hope. And now we come to our Bible verse. Based on that hope, he, Paul writes, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is desperate here. He wants to bring Jewish Christians and Gentiles together. Don't insist on your rights. Don't let these doubtful things come in between you. Focus on what's essential. Come together. Receive one another. Accommodate one another. Remember, God has always had His promises in view to, to the Jewish people, but also the Gentile people he always had a plan for. And now he prays here. Yeah, our verse is this prayer for them. Come together in this hope. Both Gentiles and Jewish Christians have this wonderful hope.
forming this new Israel of God, this new people of God. And this hope is based on believing. There's also joy and peace attached to it. And this is what characterizes this new people of God. This, they come from different backgrounds. They have distinct identities. But Paul now says, come together. What separates you, for, essentially forget it. Don't make it a big issue. Focus on what's important. And one of those things now is they have share is hope because God is faithful both to the Jewish people and to the promises he made to the Gentiles.